Welcome back to McMaster University course, Computer Science and Software Engineering 2FA3, Discrete Mathematics with Applications 2. I am Bill Farmer, and we're going to continue on the topic of mathematical proof. So we'll begin with a question, a question about how to prove a conjunction. So a conjunction is a formula like we see here, which basically we can read as A and B. How is a proper way of proving this? So the question is, what is not a valid way to prove A and B? So I'll give you a moment. You can stop your video, think about it, and come up with your answer. Okay, welcome back. Um, so a conjunction is, a, is basically putting two statements together and we will say the conjunction is true if both of the individual statements, the conjuncts, are both true. So in order, in order for A and B to be true, A must be true and B must be true. So how do we prove this? Well, we could prove A and B separately. That is a perfectly valid approach. We could prove them together. That would also be valid. We could prove A and then after we prove A, we know A is true, then we could prove B assuming that A is true. So that is also valid. T says we prove A assuming B, and then we prove B assuming A. This is not valid. This is basically circular reasoning. I assume something, and then I prove something from that, and then the thing I prove I assume, and then I, I prove my original assumption from that. This is not valid reason. Okay, so we're going to look at methods of proof for propositional formulas. So the first one we're going to look at is an implication. A implies B. Now, how do we normally prove this? Well, the way we normally prove this is we assume A and then we prove B using A. In a sense, that's what an application says. It basically says if we assume A is true, is B true. So that's how we deal with the implication. So if you're asked to prove something in the form, if A is true, then B follows, you're going to assume A, and assuming A, you're going to try to prove B. Okay, so the second case is, how does one prove a negation? Prove that something is not true. Well, we could just try to prove it directly. Uh, but another approach, very common approach, is that we assume A and then try to derive a contradiction. So we basically show if A is true, then we're going to have a contradiction. So A can't possibly be true. So the negation of A must be true. Okay, so the next form is a conjunction. This is what we talked about before. And as you would guess, there are two ways of proving this. We can prove A and then prove B assuming A. Uh, we could also, though, if we wanted to, we could um, prove B and then prove A assuming B. But usually, when you see a conjunction, it's usually set up so the, the first thing that comes is what you should assume first. I mean, excuse me, what you should prove first. And the second thing, when you prove that, you can use what you've already proven first. Okay, what about a disjunction? The disjunction is A or B. Here we have to show that A is true or that B is true. So this is Normally how you would do it, we assume that A is not true, and then prove B, or we assume that B is not true, and then prove A. What do we do with an if and only if statement, or what's called uh, a by implication or a by conditional? This is A if and only if B. How do we prove this? Well, we actually try to have to prove two things. We prove that A implies B, 
and B implies A. Because A if and only B basically, its meaning is A implies B and B implies A. Okay, so let's look at some methods of proof for quantified formulas. So if we're going to be asked to prove a universal statement, in this case the statement is for all x, all members x of a set s, a holds. How do we prove this? Well, the standard and most general approach is to assume that x is some member of s and then prove a. Now presumably a is going to be a statement that says something about x. We're just going to prove a then. So because we're assuming x is a member of s, we really don't know anything about the value of x. We just know it's a member of s. And if we can prove a knowing nothing about the value of x, except that it's a member of s, that is an effective way of proving a universal statement. OK, so let's go on. Another approach would be to prove the negation of this statement, or excuse me, assume the negation of this statement, and then derive a contradiction. So the negation of for all x in S A holds is there exists an x in S such that x does not hold. So that's the second approach. And a third approach works sometimes. Suppose S is finite. There's only a finite number of members, let's say a1 through an. Then what we can do is we can substitute for x the first member and then try to prove that statement and do this for each of the a's. And if we can prove each instance, the instance of a for each of the members of s, then basically we've shown that a holds for all members of s. Now the fourth approach is there may actually be an induction principle for s. For instance, s might be the natural numbers, and we, we have mathematical induction as induction principle. Then we can prove a universal statement by the induction principle. And this is something we're going to be looking into in great detail in our next topic in this course. OK, so how does one prove an existential statement? Well the standard way is you find some member of s remember an existential statement like this there exists x in s such a is true you need to you just find some member of a and s that when we instantiate a uh, capital a with this little a we get a statement that we can prove so in other words we we found an element in S, and we show that A for that element is true. Uh, another approach is just to assume that what we're trying to prove is false and then drive a contradiction. So the statement there exists an X in S such that A holds, the negation of that is that for all X in S, A does not hold. Okay, so let's Let's look at um, some terminology about theorems. I'll remind you a theorem is a statement for which there is a proof. It's a statement that says a certain conclusion follows from a certain set of premises. Now, in mathematical practice, we have lots of different kinds of theorems and we give them different names. I thought it would be a good idea if I go over these names so you have a sense of what the names mean. So you see I have some names in red. These are all theorems. They're different kinds of theorems. So when you see someone says something as an axiom, they mean that this is a theorem whose truth is assumed. It is, it is something we're going to assume to be true. It is a theorem, but we don't actually prove it's true. We just assume it's true. So we call these axioms. A proposition is a theorem that is immediately or easily proved. It is, it is, a, 
it may, it's an almost obvious fact. So to help the reader of a mathematical document understand what you're doing, you say it's a proposition. They know it's a simple little fact that that is almost obviously true or we can easily prove. Now, often you'll see theorems that are called lemmas. A lemma is a theorem whose main purpose is to be used to prove other theorems, more fundamental theorems. So it's not a theorem that's interesting in its own right. It's a theorem that is a tool to prove other theorems. Now, mathematicians will call a theorem a theorem when that theorem is of fundamental importance. This is an important result. This is what we're working towards. This is what we're trying to show. They'll call that a theorem. And a corollary, it is a theorem, usually also of fundamental importance like a theorem, but it follows immediately from other theorems. So, so often when someone's developing mathematics, they start with some axioms, they make some definitions, they prove some propositions, they prove some lemmas, they use those lemmas to prove a theorem, and then from that theorem they, they state some corollaries. That's typically what you will see. Okay, so I'm going to end with some basic proof terminology that comes up all the time. And this will, I hope, help you out a bit. The phrase if and only if, which is abbreviated as IFF, it means logical equivalence. So if I say A if and only if B, what I mean is A implies B and B implies A. The word obvious, when you see in a proof, it means almost no thinking is needed. It, it is helping the reader by saying, you shouldn't need to think long about this. This is an obvious fact. Uh, the word clearly, or the phrase can be easily shown, means that the result can be verified with little effort. It may not be obvious, but if you just put in a little bit of effort, you'll see that this is true. The phrase is trivial case or trivial argument. These refer to cases or arguments that are extremely simple. They have a sense, extremely simple structure. Uh, the phrase straightforward argument, which is a really important phrase, it means that an argument, which may be very long, it may be a tedious argument, but every step of the argument is pretty much obvious. So even though the argument can be long and tedious, it's easy to, easy to develop the argument because it's pretty obvious what each step is. A proof is similar to another proof if it employs the same structure or techniques. So often in a proof, uh, you could have a proof that breaks down to, let's say, into four cases, and you prove the first case carefully, and you basically say to the reader, the second, third, and fourth cases are similar to the first case. So you haven't given the proofs for the second, third, and fourth cases, but you expect the reader will have no difficulty in constructing those proofs by just following how the first proof went. So, so similar means, as I said, it has a similar structure or uses similar techniques. A brute force verification is one in which every possible case is individually verified. So remember, we could have a universal statement that says, uh, for all members of this set, this fact is true. And a brute force verification is we go through and we make sure that fact is true for every member of the set. Now, of course, this only works if our set is finite. But, but brute force is we check every possibility. A symmetric argument is an argument that we obtain by another argument by a structure-preserving transformation. Um, so we could have an argument where um, we prove something one way, and then we show that 
if we take what we proved and look at the dual statement, for instance, we could have a statement about conjunction, and then the dual statement would be something about disjunction, and we can show that the argument for conjunction can be transformed into an argument for disjunction. So this would be a symmetric argument. This is what we mean by a symmetric argument. A notion is well-defined if its definition is fully and precisely defined. The phrase, the following are equivalent, which is often abbreviated TFAE, it refers to a list of logically equivalent statements. So many theorems are the form, the following are equivalent. So it may list five statements and it says the following are equivalent. In order to prove that, you have to show they're equivalent. A stand away is you would say statement one implies statement two, statement two implies statement three, statement three implies statement four, statement four implies statement five, and statement five implies statement one. So you have a circular set of implications. That would be a standard way of proving that a list of a list of statements are logically equivalent. The phrase without loss of generality, generality, which is abbreviated by WLOG, it tells the reader that it is it is sufficient to consider a special case. So instead of proving the general case, you prove just a special case. Now normally you, this the, normally this isn't valid. You can't prove a general case by proving a special case. But without loss of gener generality is telling the reader that all we need to do is prove a special case because if we can prove the special case, the other cases will be exactly the same. Uh, QED, uh, which is Latin, or the abbreviation for the Latin phrase, quadrat demonstratum, which is also noted sometimes in books by a square box or a square box that is colored in. This signifies that the proof is complete. Okay, so that ends our second lecture. That ends our topic on mathematical proof. Um, many of the ideas that we've expressed in this topic, you're going to see in the exercises and the lectures that follow. And it's probably a good idea to come back and refer to this lecture now and then. Okay, uh, thank you very much. See you later.